So just to tell a little bit about myself, my name is Karsten Monk. Uh, I'm Chief Research Engineer at Jolla, and well, this practically means that I look at all, all the stuff while everybody else is doing the work, to be honest. So we started Jolla in 2011. Uh, many of us have a quite solid background in uh, the open source community, mainly from the Migo and uh, Memo.org communities. And this is the next part is marketing message, just for good measure. Uh, this means that we're quite strong believers in creating meaningful things together with the community, whatever that means, but I'm sure that you do know what that means. We are a company of roughly 90 people, uh, not only in Finland and Hong Kong, but many people work from their home in their respective uh, countries. So, as a company, we've been on quite a journey to get at where we um, are today, and one of the results is that we produced a mobile device. Um, I'm not actually going to bore you uh, by going through the specifications of the device. You can see them perfectly fine up there. Um, but this is the device that today is in the hands of consumers. And if you're interested in getting one, uh, you can uh, go to yola.com and uh, go from there. So just out of curiosity, how many in this room has the device already? <laughs> uh, okay. So. If you don't have one, but you would like to play around with one on a little, little deeper level, and you actually have Wi-Fi working here, and you have an IPv6 compatible stack, or whatever, uh, you can look at these instructions and try to access the device. Um, don't reboot the device, please. <laughs> uh, or you can try to approach one of the people who just put up their hands and ask them what they actually um, they actually feel about this device, because I can give you a lot of marketing talk, and it's not going to be very nice, and it's going to be really boring, but you should listen how the user feels about his actual device, because that's actually what matters. Otherwise, you can uh, come to me afterwards, uh, the talk, and I can give you a demo. So, one issue that is probably fairly important for many people in this room uh, is the topic of tinkerability of the device. It's um, also a topic that's very important to myself as well because I don't personally buy devices unless I know that I can hack them. That means I can install my own kernel, I can install my own file system, and I can boot the damn thing. So you can kind of consider this a declaration of hackability for the device. We have some sad situations. We can't provide factory images for the device because of third party restrictions, et cetera, et cetera. But the rest of the setup is quite good. You can get full root, of the, full root on the device if you want to, to a developer mode. You can unlock your bootloader as of the update of yesterday. Um, the kernel source is available. Uh, the VLAN driver is sadly closed source at the moment, but that's because it comes together with a kind of combination that we got from the ODM, and there's an open source version of it available that is a later version that actually works on top of the kernel as well. We were just not able to take it into use at that point. And um, since we give people the ability to get food, full root on their devices, that this kind of power comes with responsibility, and for whatever, some reasons, it might affect your warranty status, just general thing. But don't get anything to burn or anything like that, and you should generally be fine. So another part of the journey that we've been on is that we build a mobile operating system. Um, this is a mobile architectural art diagram, and it has absolutely no base in, basis in reality. Uh, because, as we all know, what this really means is practice is, it's a bunch of components. It's things like systemd, core utils, conman, ofono, etc. It, it's supporting tools like SDKs, build farm software, QA tools. And the kind of key points I like to bring up of Selfish OS is that it's a systemd, core utils, EDLibc, RPM, libzip, <clears throat> Wayland and Qt5 stack that is able to leverage existing hardware adaptations as in the software that talks to the device hardware. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to bother you with the details of all this, uh, except for very few topics, because you can look at the different terms, Google them, so you might know them in the first place, etc. So, as some of you, if you have followed your story a little bit, you knew that uh, back in April, uh, we got into the kind of interesting uh, situation that we had to change the entire uh, reference design that we had built our device on. Um, last year, we were in this exact, this exact uh, d uh, dev room, and we presented our QT4 X11 base stack. And 
because we had to change this, uh, uh, our system on chip, this meant that what we had thought about for Sailfish 2.0 became Sailfish 1.0. <clears throat> and what this, what this mean, meant was that uh, what we had thought about for Sailfish 2.0 suddenly became 1.0 and my summer holiday was destroyed. <laughs> um, we switched to some new technology uh, called Liphybris, which I'll be explaining a little bit more about in the end of the talk, um, where we are able to leverage existing Android hardware adaptation. We switched away from X X11 because, practically speaking, it wasn't possible to get X11 and OpenGL drivers and so on for interesting hardware, uh, and we switched to Wayland. But uh, compared to some other approaches in the open source ecosystem, uh, we didn't uh, decide to reinvent the entire thing, uh, write our own display, uh, display server and so on. So the, that had the benefit that we um, could develop the user interface using existing components that already existed today. We could combine VirtualBox together with Mesa, LMVM Pi for software rendering, Wayland, existing compositors, and then develop the hardware alongside, the te the, uh, alongside that we were developing uh, the UI and the entire stack. And the result of this, you can see in the kind of fo following slides, it's not mockups, it's not cardboard applications that uh, are just screenshots when you ac enter them. It's a real operating system that, as you can see, many users are using today as their daily devices. So with this stack that I mentioned just before, we built a quite beautiful UI. And because of the low resolution, you can't exactly see all the details. And now I'd like, just like to talk a little bit about how uh, factually to con uh, contribute to Sailfish OS. Just a moment. And there's a couple of challenges in this because um, there's many, many different forms of contributions beyond code. And I'm sure that most of you know that. There's things like ideas, bug reports, enhancement requests, uh, well, constructive criticism, uh, translations, hugs, artwork, community support between each other, virtual keyboards, layouts, events. Some of you might have visions about how you would like the device to be, etc. Hardware hacks. And what we kind of, we took that and we did something a little different than uh, you would normally expect from an uh, open source project is that we didn't open up Axilla. Uh, we didn't open just feedback forms for end users. Uh, instead, we went ahead and took an open source piece of software called AskBot, uh, which is called, where we put it on togetheryola.com, uh, where we try to kind of combine the aspect of uh, user issues and being able to kind of co create uh, together with um, developers. Um, different functions of our company, uh, users, and m most, if not all, of our, our, all of the company is participating in the site, even our CTO, our UI designers, and so on. So it is something that makes you able to get in touch with the people who make your device and work together with them, them to make it better. And it might be a little controversial that we kind of ask people to add bug reports in this kind of uh, setup, but it has worked pretty decently for the most part because the kind of votes and the comments on this side, it, it gets taken straight into our product development process, that's our design process, and the output is then reflected back into the site again. And just for good measure, uh, I'll take questions in the end of the talk. Um, my own corner of um, togetheryola.com um, is called the Skunk Works after, well, if you don't know what Skunk Works is, it's a kind of labs where you do strange kind of things, futuristic looking things, etc. And we kind of try to explore and discuss more wild topics in mobile devices. And we try to kind of evolve the ideas, do the things together there. And in order just to propose anything to this, you go ahead and ask a question, you tag it with Skunk Works, and those of us who are working full time on exp kind of exploring the future, we try to explore the, uh, the topic together with you. Now, when we're talking about co-creation, that doesn't all only mean that um, 
that uh, one side is contributing, obviously, it's both sides, not just the users contributing, it's also the company. So this is pretty much our open sourcing policy right now, is that everything except for artwork, trademark, look and feel, which pretty much means UI, stuff that we don't own, and stuff that has been written by things that we can't actually reveal to anybody else, or things that require copyright transfer, you can open source that, unless you get permission. So it's quite a flexible uh, strategy, and we will be showing exceptions to these rules up here uh, quite soon. Um, this has also meant that we can have kind of, have kind of avoided um, a lot of red tape in our development, as in our developers haven't had to think about if they need to close or something or something like that. If it's n anything but this, go straight ahead, and hate, uh, straight ahead and open source it. And in the following slides, uh, you'll kind of see this policy in effect. So just for good measure, I had a problem with the resolution. So I need to show you a browser window. This will take 30 seconds to set up because I couldn't get it to fit on the slides without it being completely unreadable to the rest of you. So just give me a moment. I'll first start by kind of the, um, this is evil closed source at the moment, where we have things like our messaging application, our contacts, our settings, different uh, uh, things like, for example, our store. That was not supposed to happen. <laughs> ah, okay. Good. Um, mm -hmm. Our QML components, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, if we go a little further to the left, <coughs> well, if, at the same time, if we go a little to the left, we have all the things that we have contributed into open source or are using. So of course, we are using quite a lot of the existing uh, meager.com stack that was, but we have also significantly uh, productized quite a lot of these components. These components are open source. So this is the middleware. Where, for example, we have an example like uh, the framework Lipstick, which is the framework we use to make our home screens, which means that it's extremely easy to build a, a user interface, our home screen, for Wayland compositors using QML, using this particular framework, for example. So we give all the building blocks to do all the fun things, and then uh, hopefully we'll be open sourcing more as we go. And of course, we have the kind of core, which is Qt5. Uh, GLibc, GCC, Blueset, Dbus, Bash, CoreUtils, Command, etc., etc., etc. So now back to my slides. <coughs> so um, that was the slide I already showed. So. Um, I'll be the first to acknowledge that it's a, bit, a little bit unclear how we contribute factual code to Sailfish OS at the moment because we are collecting a lot of different software components, just like the, the existing open source ecosystems that we had that Git repositories and contribution places for, for example, let's say systemd, dbus, uh, conman, ovono, etc. They're spread all over the place, so. It is a little unclear um, how you contribute a piece of code to an open source project. How on earth does it actually get into Sailfish OS? And this is something I've made it to my also per kind of personal task that I should try to improve, but I certainly don't have any good answers regarding this today. It is my, my belief that if you see something like you did on the togetheryola.com before, you can raise a question, you can raise a doubt, and then the hope is that through these specific goals, 
you can bring in people who know something about the subsystems, know about the designs, how things are supposed to be working, and then they can guide you eventually towards what components you have to work on, or not have to work on, but can work on, in order to improve this particular aspect of your device. Um, so kind of focused code development based on uh, specific topics. Um, because it is sometimes it's e easier to involve multiple functions like let's say designers, component owners, or God forbid that you need to bring in a product manager to do something, um, than just code. Because if you're operating, for example, on the UI level, it's much more than, than, than just uh, writing the code. It's about having test cases. It's about having the ability to go be uh, fluent, 60 FPS UI. And that uh, the designer actually thinks that is a, is a nice thing, and it looks good in the implementation. And um, th as I said, there's a lot that can be done to make selfish development uh, much more transparent and a lot more visibility into how code in the repositories you saw make it into selfish OS releases. And we hope to get these in order soon, but I didn't manage to get this ready uh, for FOSTEM to this time around. So. Just diving in a little bit to some specific Sailfish OS technology. Specifically LibHypris, which is kind of, it's a deep down little, uh, deep down technology in uh, Sailfish OS, uh, which enables us to leverage Android hardware rotation. I'm going to tell you how it works. And if you think it's, it's a complete hack, you're probably right, but it works quite nicely. So, this is from Wikipedia, and it is pretty telling about the technology approach on LibHypers. Uh, it's not perfect, but it, it's a little crazy. So, to summarize uh, LibHypers, it's basically the linker code from the Bionic C library uh, from Android, uh, ported to glibc environment, and a bunch of wrappers built on top of that. And what I did was that I, well, I looked at the source code and saw, well, Alinga doesn't typically spend a lot of time uh, talking to the C library because the C library is not factually loaded at that particular point when the Alinga is running. That's so a very restricted little set of code, which meant that you could actually build this with GCC as a, a glibc and it worked. And this is pretty crazy because, as I said before, this is kind of a loss of all technical sanity and contact with reality. Um, but it does solve a, a huge problem for those of us who are working alternative kind of emerging mobile OSs, which is it's impossible to find hardware if you want to use existing, uh, well, almost impossible, uh, to find existing hardware that are things that people would factually buy at decent price points that we can put our mobile OSs on. If you go to an ODM, you will get a, a, reference, a reference hardware, sure. Next thing you'll get is not a Linux BSP with X11, OpenGL ES working and everything like that, but you'll get an Android adaptation. And this is kind of a way to, for us to leverage Android hardware adaptations so we have a much larger spread we can put uh, our mobile OSs on. So going down a little deeper, this is another quote from Wikipedia. Um, in practice, if you want to load a shared object or library, you use dlopen function. Uh, then you go ahead and locate uh, the address of some elf symbols. And um, then you have with dlsim, and then in order to execute those functions, you have to use function pointers. So my initial experiment was with this was that well, as I said before, I built the Bionic Linker for glibc. I renamed its deal open, deal sim, deal close to Android prefix because, frankly speaking, it's not, it shouldn't collide with the, uh, with the glibc symbols. And I disabled all kind of dependency loading, as in if there was an elf de a dependency for libc so, it didn't load that, fair enough. I built a small shared object against uh, Bionic just simple function. I uh, deal opened the thing. I may, I have made a function pointer uh, to the elf symbol, and I tried to call it, and it worked. Um, 
and just to kind of step up my amount of headache with this particular issue, um, it kind of seemed ridiculous that someone would go ahead and try to load Bionic and DLibc in the same, in the same uh, product process as address space. So that's what I did. Um, and for all intents and purposes, this should have crashed massively, but it continued working because what just happens is that it mmaps the code into memory, and for the most part, they don't. For the most part, they don't conflict, except for a couple of problems where. I have to give this disclaimer that problems in this particular case might mean significant technical nightmares. Um, first off, Bionic and GLibc has two different implementations of how they use the thread local storage, which is kind of per thread uh, area uh, where, you, as it says, they can store uh, values and so on. Uh, basically, if you try to go and use the Bionic pitred uh, uh, methods in uh, while still in glibc, it will completely corrupt uh, the thread uh, local storage or the thread descriptor. And this meant that we kind of had to go in and make a bunch of wrappers. And the reason why we could do make a bunch of wrappers is because we, the linker, we decide where uh, the symbols get resolved to. So for example, if I have uh, pthread mutex log in my uh, uh, bionic uh, shared object, it would then be able to be redirected to my own little wrapper convert it to something glibc like and well, uh, things start working. And um, other fun things is that when you're doing a, a system call, there's a, again a per thread li uh, variable, uh, Eleanor. And of course, these are two different places in uh, Bionic and glibc. So we had to go in and make methods for, hack uh, um, for um, hooking this. And we also had additional fun things on ARM. Uh, this um, Bionic is using f um, soft um, float ABI, which meant that when we're calling a procedure and we have float arguments, um, this means that the arguments will go into the integer registers instead on the soft FP. But in hard uh, floating point, this means the, the, the arguments will go into the floating point registers. So this meant that, for example, if we had a library um, like OpenGL, which is using a lot of floats, we had to go in and make wrappers for these that convert between the, the two calling conventions. So what we did is uh, that we went in and patched Bionic because we had a bit of tricks, then we can choose to use another Bionic because, well, Android doesn't really need it at that point. And we ended up with quite a nice set of uh, wrappers that actually just work. And the device this, that you see today are running on top of this well, in the start it was a hack, now it's a little better. And the applic applicability of this is, is quite clear. We can kind of access the all kind of well-known, well-defined uh, Android hardware adaptation interfaces, uh, OpenGL, that kind of stuff, and we can build a, a mobile OS stack on top of it. It's quite simple. Go and load the eGL library, make a function pointer, call it, and we make wrappers based on this because we know the ABI in the first place. And we've been successfully able to do this. Um, and in, when I say we, I don't mean YOLA in this particular instance, but I mean uh, the Hadley Piper's uh, team or whatever we're calling it, uh, where we've been able to access uh, things like uh, Android, Gralloc, um, OpenGLES, NFC, all the hardware adaptation layer stuff we can get our hands on, OpenCL, Surface Flinger, which is Android's uh, compositor, OpenMax, camera, hardware composition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the, another thing that I've done is uh, Wayland on LePipers. So this is something I've already tried to explain in my uh, blog, which is uh, mer-project.blogspot.com. <clears throat> because, well, we want to put Wayland on top of Android hardware adaptations because Wayland is cool. It's thought true. It's already quite well tested on uh, desktop side, and best of all, we didn't have to reinvent anything. <clears throat> so how, in practice, you could do this with uh, the existing Android drivers is that what we can do is factually we, we, well, we, we wrap libgl, but 
one good thing about uh, the Android graphics stack is that it's modeled around when you are making a window service with EGL or taking a, a service into use for EGL usage, you can you pass what is called the a native window, which is basically a structure indicating we're tied uh, hooks like queuing a buffer, dequeuing a buffer, which practically means give me a buffer I want to um, render into it. And this meant that we didn't have to go in and modify every single OpenGLES driver in order to get Wayland support. And I'll just explain a moment that uh, how that is possible. Um, these particular hooks, like QBuffer, DQBuffer, is using a type called a native window buffer, which contains a so-called uh, Android native handle. Now, if you want to allocate a graphical buffer in Android, you have to use the aptly named Graloc. And what this gives you is native handles, which is practically file descriptors, as in, as you know, file descriptors are factually kernel objects, integer values. And because they're kernel objects, this means that you can uh, share these file descriptors between processes through a process called um, uh, file descriptor passing. And then um, it is possible to then take this particular graphical buffer and register it into your uh, context of um, uh, your kind of GPU context and then take it into use. So if you need to get Wayland to work on your stack, um, you have to have an EGL stack that spe speaks Wayland, as in it takes a Wayland window in this particular case, which is a VLEGL window in this particular case. And we can do that because we wrap EGL, so we can go and, for, and hook every call that goes to EGL window, create window service. We can then have allocate our buffers when we get the request of uh, DQ buffers. Um, and uh, we can then share these buffers to file, file descriptive to parsing, and then in the end use the buffer as a texture within our open GL scene graph. And well, then we obviously, since we have Wayland's uh, amount of control about the buffer, the state, visibility, et cetera, well, we have a compositor, an a, a GPU accelerated compositor. So that was quite easy to do in, in the end. And um, some of the kind of arguments that was made against uh, Wayland originally um, on embedded ARM devices is that it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have server side buffers, which some stacks uh, require. So supposedly were requiring, but we've had Lipibus and Wayland on practically every uh, SOC GPU that we can get our hands on, and I've not seen any kind of requirement like that so far. But it is worth remarking that sometimes server side, as in compositor side. Um, buffers may be useful for, for example, sharing the wallpaper, the icons, that kind of stuff to keep down the memory amount. And libhypers today, uh, initially it was open source according to the open source policy you saw before from Yola. So it's a technology that we made in the company, well I made in this particular case. It's one of the few projects where we have multiple competing solutions working together on a, on a, towards a common goal. We have Selfish OS, we have Intel slash Tyson, we have Canonical slash Ubuntu, OpenVR, Vorbeos, and many others. We've tested on many different uh, versions, SOCs, architectures. We have a Git repository, and we have a nice little IRC channel for this. So, since we are getting towards the end of my talk, uh, if you're paying attention in the start of the talk, we're talking about that it might cost a little less if you paid attention to this talk. And uh, it is possible to uh, get a, a cheaper YOLA, uh, 40 euros cheaper, um, under these conditions, uh, if you use this uh, FOSDEM 2014 code. Mm -hmm. And thank you for listening. Any questions? It's a free hat if you ask a good question. <laughs> Actually, this I would live hybrid, but around the build system, scratch box. And one question is why is scratch box not using or 
native or why are we not using a native cross compiler and using the scratchbox? Yeah, so 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 the scratchbox setup is that well, first off, well, the, let me just re rephrase the, uh, t tell the question again, that you're asking about why we are not using native builds and instead using Scratchbox, which is a cross-compilation framework. And the primary reason for this is that we need to be able to cross-build our applications. For example, our SDK, it has to be installed on obscure targets such as Windows or Mac. And um, this means that, well, we can't exactly hand everybody an ARM board to build our systems on, so that's first thing. Second thing is that uh, while it is very nice to build natively, for the most part, it is faster to do the builds on a very strong and significantly multi-core x86 device at a server, so that's what we've done, where we can put a large amount of RAM. Native building is technically cleaner, sure, but at the same time, we're not, we haven't seen any kind of ill side effects from doing so. No, it, it doesn't. It uses a file system redirection, which is, is just as evil. Uh, but yes. yes. And, and my question was just about uh, the cross compiling reverse without. So, 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 for, for, Okay, so the question is why? Why is isn't it? Uh, uh, well, it's using a virtual machine. Is it? Uh, is it? Okay, now I've got your question. <laughs> um, but to, yeah, to lo long story short, uh, it might be using a virtual machine. But for ni ninety-five percent of the time, when you're doing a typical autoconf-based build, it will spend most of the time in existing host tools anyway. Um, you said that using the pipers, you got uh, you can get the hardware compositor from Android working. Uh, so, are you using uh, any of the hardware compositor uh, capabilities to uh, do layers in Wayland, like uh, for so example, have a video layer that does the color? Mm -hmm. So, just 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 to remember your question, I'll just stop you early. Just uh, long story short. Um, the question was: Are we using the hardware composer to actually factually? Um, um, you actually take multiple layers of our UI using uh, Wayland and compose these together with the, the hardware composer. In our current system, we're not. In Wayland, there is something called subservices. We are sadly on Wayland 1.1.0, which doesn't have subservices, but we would like to start taking subservices into account. The second problem is that uh, hardware composer in the hardware composer version we have on the device, uh, we need to integrate it quite tightly together with our compositor scene graph, and this was quite complicated at that, that, that particular point. So at the moment, the only thing we're using the hardware composer for is flipping buffers to the screen. But we would like to improve that in the future. And someone said this up to what's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, what, what, what else are you using? Okay, we, we, uh, so the question is what else we're using the pipers for in this device? We're using it for NFC. We're using it for, well, OpenGL, as you said before. We're using it for Hardware Composer. Uh, we are not using it for modem, but we are using it for Audio Hell. Um, but doesn't Android use also? It, some devices might use ELSA deep down as well, but for the most part, when you're doing a device, you don't want to spend that terribly long time on the hardware. You want to spend time on the things that matters to users, which is the experience. So you can go in and, and write your own custom configuration for ELSA, or you can take something that works in the first place. No, I don't do that. <laughs> yes. uh, Android seems to be sharp on pretty old kernel version. Do you see this as a problem and how do you see it developing in the future? And well, it, 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 for you? It is uh, a problem when we have to deal with deal with system uh, D, which just does not does not necessarily like that old kernel. So yes, that is a problem. But uh, the fact is that when you're making well, the, the fact that uh, hmm? ah so you uh, you're asking if it was a problem that uh, Android is stuck on such old uh, kernel versions, and as I said, it's 
it is a bit of a problem when you're dealing with modern uh, Linux software like SystemD that always requires extra kernel versions and so, uh, kernel features, etc. But at the same time, we also have to accept that when a, a device reference kit from ODM comes out, it will have a certain kernel, and for the most part, it will be very difficult to move it to a more modern kernel as well. Uh, we tried to do this in Eagle times with, for example, the N900. We had the same people who had made the kernel adjustments to the kernel and asked them to upstep, move it to a, a further away, uh, like more recent version, and it was uh, a really significantly hard exercise. So generally, yes, please upstream all your code, but for, for example, for this device, I'm not expecting so much that our kernel will be updated beyond fixes and security fixes. More questions? Android and install software, for example, even for the F-Droid store, there are no um, security questions asked. Um, why did you decide to do this? Uh, is it shortcoming or...? Um, I think time is a good answer. So the question was, why are we not asking about the typical security questions when Android is uh, Android applications installed on the device? And I think, honestly, the time has been the issue in this particular case. You need to integrate the security parameters of Android together with the, the rest of the system. And this takes time. At the same time, the initial people who have bought this, this device is also people who know how to be secure in their devices. But yes, of course, this is something that should be fixed. Uh, how does the Yola security model work? I, I assume you don't use Aegis from MIMO 6, but you don't use <laughs> well, uh, so, so you're asking about how the Yola security model works. and. Um, um, well, and just to add to that, we are not using Aegis, which is a uh, security framework significantly used to lock down a device completely. So, the worst possible answer I can give at the moment is we're using the typical POSIX security model, as in that we have a single user. Uh, some applications might be running into different GIDs and that kind of stuff, but I'm not the right person to ask this, answer this particular question. Could be better. <laughs> I don't think, uh, so the question is, what kind of actions would void warranty? Uh, I, I would be honest, honestly saying that I, I don't know, because we haven't had that many cases where we would have to. Uh, it, but in terms of, let's say that you go ahead and overclock your device and you burn out the chip. This is obviously not a problem of ours as such that you did this. But uh, I, I'm not the right person to ask, answer about uh, warranty policy, sadly. Yeah, so, so the question was, what is the overhead of libhypers if you just compare it to uh, um, native, uh, like straight usage? So uh, it depends on what level you're looking at. It is a just a function point, a call in practice. There's a little bit of memory cost because we do load in some additional libraries that we might not necessarily would have had to if it was a native driver. But in terms of performance, we are not seeing a significant regression. If you're looking at the really deeper side, there has been a guy that has been developing recently that our wrappers are reduced to something like three, four arm instructions or something like that. Uh, so it is possible to get it working much quicker than it is. Oh boy. Um. Okay, so the question is, uh, when, once we have applied a kind of embarrassing uh, power consumption problem that we had on the device, um, then uh, we have quite good uh, uh, power management of the device. And uh, the question is that we go into very deep suspend uh, a little too often. Uh, 
a little too often as in that some cases might, there might be that we would like to wake up to, for example, to check email that, um, um, or for example, to execute uh, some timers, et cetera. And we are not doing enough of that at the moment. We have uh, a QML originated framework called Nemo uh, Keep Alive that enables you to be woken up at certain times. But it, it is an effect of seeing that the device basically goes into very, very deep sleep. And some might argue that it's too deep sleep, but some have also played with that if you just disable the completely deep sleep, that you still get quite a battery still. And this is because it's modern hardware. Um, for what, what kind of uh, hardware hacks do we have uh, in works for other halves? Um, so the question was, what are kind of hardware hacks do we have in works for other halves? So, um, for I think it's better to talk about what the community is doing because uh, fairly fairly soon we'll be putting out a kind of official SDK for the, the, all, the all half stuff. But the uh, the um, the community have done things like hardware keyboard. They have done put OLED on the back of the device. They have um, wireless charging, etc. So there's many kind of interesting projects that are possible to do. Uh, regarding ourselves, well, I can't exactly say what our plans are, but we, we, we also feel that we are enablers for these kind of things. Yeah. How did you achieve Android compatibility app? So the Android com com compatibility, I'm talking about. I guess you're talking about the applications. What done? It was done by a third-party provider called Myriad. So I can't exactly say in details about how it works. No, it is certainly not open source. You could replace it with open source, though. <laughs> Nobody stops you. As a user, um, when is Kartel uh, and Kaldau? Support. Yes, as a user, when is the Kartao and Kaldao support, you know, online synchronization of calendars and that? Mm. So the question is, as a user, uh, when is uh, Kartao and Kaldao supported? So there is a togetheryour.com item about this, and I'm pretty sure you probably made it. Uh, but uh, no, okay. But anyway, that that it is something that is is, is being looked at, but I don't have any answers today. I'm sorry. Can, 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 can other people in Jolla implement it? Are there, are there APIs there to implement it? Uh, yes, there's a synchronization framework that you can be using. Mm -hmm. um. uh, you talked about uh, how anxiety is to have to learn something. You talked about the fact that you need to interpret it. So the question is, 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 is uh, what we're planning on updating, and I think I have to end soon, uh, updating f specific components. But we are looking into uh, QT 5.2 at the moment, and the updated scene graph. And this will come when it's ready. Let's just say it like that. Uh, if you have any additional questions, you can try to find me afterwards and ask me some questions. If you haven't, if you haven't gotten a hat already, please come and collect one. <laughs>